I'm Michael Coburn. Um, I'm part of one of the oh, the committee uh, for the Edinburgh Bodians and Fife District Centre. What a mouthful! It used to be called the Edinburgh District, so it's much easier. But there we are. We defined tonight. Obviously, ethics very topical in our industry and has been for quite a while uh, in there. And I'm sure that our speaker tonight is well known to us. As he pointed out to me earlier today, he was the man that purchased this place, uh, made the institute grow up at 125 years. Thank you very much for coming. I'm sure we'll have an enjoyable session. And to lead us and uh, facilitate us in that, I'd like to introduce really a man that needs no introduction, a writer uh, on the subject of ethics, certainly somebody who has consulted very widely, not only in our own industry, but in others. So could I ask you to welcome Charles Munn. We have to think quite seriously about the, about the view of the public in relation to banking and bankers. Uh, we have to think very seriously about what it is that uh, we can do to enhance that reputational issue. And just last week this came to hand. It's a, a paper by a company called Edelman looking very seriously and, and professionally at the reputational issues in banking today. He says here, most developed markets have placed trust in banks below 50%, which is a sign of being untrustworthy, with the Irish, Spanish, Brits and Dutch having the least trust and the biggest drop in opinion of their banks, whilst the Chinese and Indians have the most trust. Well, watch this space is all I can say as so far as China and India are concerned. Um, and then he goes on further on in this paper, he says, um, interestingly, as in another survey just released, the British trust their banks far more than their governments to protect them from financial losses. So it may be just as Brits are pretty distrustful by nature of any, any kind of institution or organisation. So, but, you know, but that's a symptom, I think, of, of a, a wider malaise, you know, a concern and that we have as bankers that uh, we are not well considered and not well trusted and that there are some good reasons for that but equally it's important to, to put out a message there that that is not the whole story and, and far from it and I think tonight I would hope to get with you to some point where we might have some more rigorous and better understanding of, of, of some of the more positive points. So the question really I want to address with you tonight is, um, can you be a professional in the financial services world today? And clearly that is a job that the professional bodies have set out. And you can see here from this banner that uh, this institute is leading financial professionalism. But is it possible? That's the real question we have to try and, and think about and to, to address. After all, people will tell you and most of you will have a lot more experience of this than, than I do, that the big drivers nowadays, in, in not just in the financial services world, in business generally, um, are sales targets and bonuses. I, I spent last year the night, the evening, in the company of some young graduates from the MBA programme at, at Warwick University. And throughout the night, you know, as the drink flowed, um, we got talking about all sorts of things, obviously, but you know, when it got around to talking about business, it was very clear that, you know, that their focus in life, if you like, was the next car that they would get from their company, the bonus. Um, whether, they, whether they deserved it didn't seem to enter into their thinking. It was simply the thing that they were, that they were focused upon. And I would like to suggest to you, too, I think that, that a, lot of, a lot of business schools you know, really promote that kind of thinking, you know, and the number of nowadays who are, who are teaching anything to do with professionalism and ethics is, I'm glad to say, rising, but there's probably still a lot of, a lot of progress to be made in that regard. So what is it? What is professionalism? As, as any book on the subject will tell you, there is no easy, uh, simple definition of that. Uh, my definition of it, for what it's worth, is that professionalism, as, as you experience it as a customer, um, is a measure of a person's experience, their qualifications, uh, their competence, and their public interest. Uh, so I'm really looking at this from the point of view of the consumers of financial services. Because 
consumers of financial services, when you ask them the question, they will expect a person they're dealing with in a financial services environment to be a professional person. They expect what they get from you to be safe, to be secure, uh, to be honest, and to be in their own best interest. You know, and, and we can all think of immediately some examples of where that has not been the case uh, in recent years. So there's a challenge here for us. So the question I think we have to think about beyond that is how is it um, that we, um, how we can make a professional person? Um, now, I entered banking, as some of you know, in 1964, so that makes me pretty old. Um, and in those days, you entered as a youngster, uh, 16 or 17 years old, and you did the back desk, and then you did the cash, and you learned gradually all the other bits of the running of a branch. Your first promotion might come at the age of 30, if you were very good. And the point of that was that you had a very long time in which to absorb the ethos and the ethics of the business. You know, you had a long time in which to to be a part of what went on on a day-to-day -day basis, and that way you learned it. Nowadays, of course, young people enter as graduates very often, 21 or 22, and you know they get a lot of responsibility at a very early age, and if they're not chief executive by the time they're 28, they feel as if they failed. Um, but uh, now, the point I'm making here is that intellectually, there's absolutely no problem with that. But that old experience thing. <coughs> is not there. You know, that, that time in the job to absorb it, to really learn from people who are older and wiser, uh, doesn't seem to exist in the way that it once did. So professional bodies, I'd like to suggest to you, have a role in this. And the role is, is multifaceted, really. Um, traditional view of a professional body was quite simple. It was to provide an education uh, for young people coming into uh, the sector, or any sector for that matter. That was certainly the case in 1988 when I came here as Chief Executive. Um, just at that time, at that very time, I had been on the Church of Scotland Special Commission on the Ethics of Investment and Banking, which reported in 1988. And some of you have heard me give the quotes from that in the past, which sounded some warnings about the trajectory upon which the financial services sector was embarked at that time. But of course, that was all ignored. Um, but what professional bodies did then, and what this professional body did then, was simply education and virtually nothing else. And it, it took quite some time um, for us to do other things. Colin Morrison uh, joined us in 1991, round about then. And Colin will remember better than I did because he did all the hard work that we tried to persuade uh, our council at that time that there was a need for continuing professional development. And it took us quite a long time to win that argument. Um, we, we took a view too that there was a need for some kind of course on ethics. And we lost that argument twice. Um, and it wasn't until the third time we came up with the argument um, when we said you know, that the Irish Institute of Bankers were very keen to join with us in this project, and only then was it approved. And um, we, we wrote, between the two institutes, we wrote a book which has been long superseded um, by an even better book. But you know, that was a time when we were thinking too quite seriously with regulators. We, we used to go and see um, the regulators in the, in the 90s to talk about CPD and how, that, how schemes of that nature might be introduced. So it, it was a process, you know, there's nothing about it happened overnight, but th there was a growing recognition in the industry and across the industry, um, partly as a result of internal pressures and partly as, as, as a result of external pressures, which said, you know, this is what the industry needs. You know, we need to be lifelong learners. Uh, we need to be in a position to, to, to make ethical judgments on a daily basis, so we need to actually read about it because if we've not had a long experience within our business to absorb ethics in, the, in that old-fashioned way, then we need to be taught it. Now, I know as well as anyone that you can't teach people to be ethical. You know, you, you can't teach people 
if they don't want to be taught. Um, but you can at least teach them uh, the basics. You can sensitise them to the issues and, and hope that they will absorb that into their, into their thinking and into their, into their practice. The Charter Insurance Institute, on whose board I've been for uh, nearly six years now, has a nice phrase. They claim to be uh, protecting, <laughs> protecting the public by guiding the profession. And you know, I think that's a, a rather neat way of putting it. And of course, there are there are ways of doing that. In most professional bodies, certainly this one has a code of conduct. Um, there is now a professional standards board. Uh, in existence to, to, to help with that. So that's the challenge for going forward and that's what I'd like to go away and discuss now for 10 or 15 minutes um, is how we get to the position where we can see with some satisfaction that we have restored trust that when we can get that 50% figure up to 75 or 80% because that's where it was not so many years ago. There was a, a famous international study done and trust in British financial institutions was running at 82%. And that's about 10 or 12 years ago now. Um, and at that time, you know, that was high, by, very high by international standards. Very high. And now it's under 50%. One of the reasons why a lot of this change took place in our banking world uh, is that in the early 1990s, banking was pretty unprofitable. You know, there was a, something of a world recession going on then, certainly. But banking as a whole uh, was rather unprofitable. So it's, it's almost understandable that, that senior people in the industry started to look for new ways in which to operate the banks. You know, staff um, cost-income ratios we're running about 70%. Now that's pretty high. We're now running about 40% or perhaps a bit less. And so that implies a lot of change, the kind of changes that most of us in this room have experienced, lived through and somewhat endured. Um, so, you know, that, you know that there are reasons for what's happened, is really what, what I'm saying. And so the, the challenge is how we get, I hesitate to say this, but how we get back to where we were. If somebody wants to argue with me that it's not possible to get back to where we were, I would be inclined to agree with them. Um, so the question is how we get forward, and there's certainly been a lot in what we've said tonight about how we might how we might do that. Some of the things that we might do. There's no easy fix. You know, there's there's no simple. This is what we've got to do. This is our grand plan, and in a couple of years' time, we'll be back up from 50% to 80%. But let me just conclude with one thought, or a couple of thoughts, um, as to why it's important that you know, we promote professionalism, we try and get our industry re-established favourably in the minds of the public. First of all, it will be better outcomes for customers. Secondly, there will be uh, improved standards of risk management, uh, more confident and trusted profession, and more talented people attracted into the industry. Uh, better careers as a result of that, uh, and a better reputation for the market internationally. But last thought is, I don't think that's going to happen unless we can do something about enforcing professional standards.